Welcome to this new episode of The Context. Today I want to talk to you about jolting AI, the accelerating acceleration, the increasing rate of acceleration in artificial intelligence applications. I often talk about accelerating change, which measures the rate of change in a given period of time and then comparing the rates of change tries to interpolate and to understand what are the phenomena underlying it. The visual representation um, in various kinds of charts of this uh, rate of change, of course, depends on what you want to highlight. When the rate of change is very small and the variation in the rate of change is also small, then perhaps a linear chart is going to be fine. Uh, on the y-axis, you will have uh, units of whatever you want to represent. One, two, three, four, five. However, when we have an accelerating rate of change, typically we use a logarithmic chart where the y-axis represents orders of magnitude. Every unit is going to be an increasing order of magnitude, 1, 10, 100, 1000, and so on. So when we are talking about an accelerating change, the mathematical function that embodies this is the exponential function. For example, 2 to the power of x. And the exponential function will be a rapidly increasing curve when represented on a linear chart, but when represented on a logarithmic chart, the exponential function will be a line. Now, when we are uh, talking about the technologies that enable society to take advantage of various types of innovation, which is in turn analyzed and expressed in terms of accelerating technological change, we must of course reference the law of accelerating returns that was formulated by Ray Kurzweil in his book of 1999, The Age of Spiritual Machines. And then of course, again, further analyzed and, and uh, represented in various ways um, in, for example, the singularity is near. And what Ray formulates is that the traditional understanding that uh, we have a diminishing return from increasing investment in a given technology, in a given industry, is true on a small scale, but if we look at a larger scale, we can actually observe the opposite. An equal investment will generate a higher than expected return. So how can both of these be true? What happens is that we have, for any given technology, the traditional S-curve of a technology be being experimented with, then an ever-increasing understanding of how the technology can be exploited and applied. And then when we squeezed out every possible advantage of the technology, we will have a plateau where effectively further investments are not going to provide the kind of returns that we expect. And this S-curve is for any given 
single technology. But the law of accelerating returns, the exponential curves that we talk about when we talk about accelerating technologies, looks at uh, successive technologies substituting each other and designing the curve that we are finally looking at. One of the most famous examples of uh, using this kind of paradigm is Moore's law that formulated over 50 years ago said that electronic circuits would double the density of their components every 18 months and then adjust it to every two years. And this is not a natural law. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy, a projection of our desires and the expectation of, of our abilities in order for many competing teams around the world to strive to be the first to arrive at a given breakthrough. And Ray actually generalized this and looked at many technologies that preceded uh, the 60s of the 20th century when Gordon Moore um, formulated his observation. He looked at uh, electromechanical relays. He looked at diode tubes. He looked at many things that went through their individual S-curves and then smoothly one on after another fulfilled the same kind of expectation of doubling the computational power uh, in a given period of time that could have been more or less what Moore's Law also formulated. So Moore's Law applies to transistors that are then put together in integrated circuits that in turn form the CPUs, the central processing units that we have in our computers, in our mobile phones, in our servers where we connect over the internet, when we browse web servers, and so on. And an important additional component in understanding what is going on in the world of technology is what is called the innovator's dilemma. Formulated by uh, Clayton Christensen, who recently passed away, it is the pretty dramatic decision that an industry leader has to make to stop serving its current set of customers and invest instead in the development of the technologies that when put into a given set of products will serve their future customers. And the dilemma is in the fact that any investment in that future is subtracting resources in investing in the already successful present. And the uh, short-sightedness of those leaders that can't understand the necessity of this stems from the fact that if they don't do it, somebody else is going to do it so they will be disrupted and they will stop being the leader of that future generation of products. And it is indeed the case that it is very difficult to disrupt oneself. It is extremely difficult to say, I will take away resources from improving my current generation of products because I realize that I have to embrace a new, maybe unproven technology because I understand, I believe in the fact that it is going to be an essential technology of the leading solutions of tomorrow. So 
even though Intel is the leader, an undisputed leader of the era of CPU computing, of personal computers, of servers, Intel is not a leader in the next generation of computing that we are already seeing around us, which is based on GPUs in graphical processing units. The leader of that is NVIDIA. GPUs are made of transistors, just like CPUs, but their architecture is massively parallel. They are optimized rather than executing an arbitrary kind of program that is taken sequentially. Their architecture is optimized for executing those kinds of programs that can be broken down in hundreds or thousands of or millions of similar parts that are executed simultaneously across the architecture of the chip. The simplest example of these kinds of programs are the video games that we play, where calculating and designing and uh, representing the scene, whether we are fighting against aliens or driving in a car simulator, in a racing game, or any other kind of uh, graphically intensive task, uh, the kind of calculations that the computer has to make are basically the same pixel by pixel. Not the result of the calculations, but the kind of calculations. NVIDIA and some other companies recognized this early and they created chips specialized for these graphically intensive tasks. And they became important in that. They became a leader in that. Now, it is today frequently reported in mainstream media articles or even some specialized articles that Moore's Law is ending. And that is mistakenly equated to innovation in computers ending as well. Now, the era of traditional CPUs becoming ever more powerful may be progressing towards an end for many reasons. Um, but the age of innovation in computers is definitely not. So let's get back to what I started with. The increasing rate of acceleration in artificial intelligence. About 10 years ago, it was observed and then fully embraced that the then leading type of AI architecture was approachable efficiently by using GPUs. That kind of approach is still the leading approach today. It is a subset of machine learning called artificial neural networks and especially deep learning, which is the type of artificial neural networks where there are many, many layers, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of layers connecting the inputs with the outputs. And each of these layers makes some calculation on the data and passes the calculation onto the next layer. And the calculation and the optimization and then the execution of the optimized, what we say the trained neural network, is extremely efficient. If rather than run on traditional CPUs, if run on GPUs instead. So what is 
happening is that there is a progressive learning curve that is applied not only within a given technology, but across generations of technologies. And this learning curve enables the acceleration of change, except that we are not talking about the mere acceleration of change anymore. We are talking about an increasing rate of acceleration that derives from the learning curve being applied across many generations of technologies and the rapid, rapid coming together and employment of that learning by not only the specialists in hardware, but also the specialists in software, in uh, infrastructure, uh, architectures, and so on. Actually, in terms of technology generations, we are now talking about specialized AI chips that go beyond um, optimizing the architecture of the chip and the integrated circuit using still transistors, not only recognizing that the parallel nature of GPUs is, is great, but that we can go beyond and implementing in hardware the kind of calculations that artificial neural networks applied in deep learning need, achieving either e even greater results. So, for example, Google uh, designed such a chip uh, and uh, they are calling it TPUs, uh, Tensor Processing Units, from uh, the name of the mathematical calculations that these specialized uh, chips have to execute. So we, we went from CPUs to GPUs and now specialized AI chips, such as, for example, the TPUs. Now, a few months ago, Stanford University published their 100 plus page report on the state of the AI uh, industry. And on page, I think, 65 or something of that report, they published a chart that represented how the rate of doubling in the performance of the computer infrastructures if we take into account the infrastructure available for artificial intelligence applications changed from following Moore's law for the past 50 years to following a different curve over the course of the past 10 years. And they calculated uh, the amount of computation available, compute, in terms of the global infrastructure that a given set of problems uh, require, expressed in petaflop per second days. And this unit of measure uh, is similar to what you would look at in the uh, energy consumption of your home, where the power available is expressed in kilowatt and kilowatt hours is the amount of energy that your house consumes um, uh, and, and, and needs in order to function. So a typical uh, Western European house has uh, uh, three kilowatt of power available and then if you turn on your uh, washer and dryer and uh, your um, hair dryer and your dishwasher at the same time, you often end up exceeding that power available uh, and, and your energy provider will trigger a, a breaker circuit and you will realize, oh my God, I have to turn some appliance off. So similarly to that, we can look at what are the 
applications that we can practically and usefully attack at the availability of a given power in computation. How many petaflop per second we can deploy and if we need 10,000 years to complete a, a, a task, we will just not do it. But if we can train a neural network to solve a given challenge fast enough, and then that neural network can uh, be applied to that task after being trained usefully, all of this within budget and within a given amount of time, then we can actually solve problems that were unsolvable before. So if we were on the curve of Moore's law, exponential on a linear chart, linear on a logarithmic chart, over the course of the past eight, 10 years, we would have seen a sevenfold improvement in this availability of compute and in the type of problems that as a consequence we are able to attack. Instead, as Stanford University mapped the availability of computer power and the application of that computer power, how much we were able to uh, dedicate to a given problem set, they saw that over the course of the past eight years, which they went to look, we had a 300,000-fold improvement. So they took a given route and together with Stanford University, also OpenAI, another organization dedicated to the um, analysis and implementation of advanced artificial intelligence applications, uh, looked at this data set and they said, okay, let's do a linear interpolation of the first set and then another linear interp interpolation of the second set. And they concluded that the doubling used to be two years according to Moore's law before, and now the doubling is between three, four months. Now, why not? That kind of simplistic approach is possible. But I propose a little more sophisticated approach. Rather than doing a linear interpolation, we can draw an exponential curve on the logarithmic chart and say that what we are looking at is the increase in the rate of acceleration of our computing infrastructure when we take into account the latest software and hardware architectures. And that is why I say that AI is jolting. Jolt is the first derivative of acceleration. Jolt represents an increasing rate of acceleration. And what we are seeing today is that AI is jolting. So what are the consequences? What does this imply? First of all, that we can expect, even within the current set of applications, potentially, the rate to increase further. But if my paradigm is correct, what we have to watch out for is that there will be an even more important increase in the availability of compute for next generation applications. And will that doubling rate be one month instead of three? Will that be one week? What will that mean? And when will that be available? Well, we have to study the numbers better. We have to try and forecast 
what kind of software and hardware components are going to be available. But I expect that we will have this new disruption, which somebody like Stanford or OpenAI will once again simplistically represent through another linear interpolation, but that it is more appropriately represented by an exponential curve on the logarithmic chart when quantum computers are going to be applied to AI problems. Or maybe the reverse, when we will use AI systems to design better quantum computers. There are already teams that are studying what each of these could be. What does it mean to design a neural network that runs natively rather than on GPUs or TPUs, AI chips, that it runs on quantum computers? Quantum computers are so massively parallel as to require an entirely new understanding of how the universe works, or rather, multiple universes, since one of the interpretations of um, quantum phenomena is the multiverse view of, of the universe. What does it mean to structure an AI application such that the output of that AI application is a better quantum computer and most likely that AI application will already be running on a quantum computer. Now, the technological singularity is the hypothetical moment in time in a future when the rate of change in the world is such that unaided humans are completely unable to comprehend it. And whether it comes from self-modifying artificial intelligence leading to the so-called intelligence explosion, whether it comes from other factors, it feels a little bit like we may be there because we haven't been designing microchips with pencil and paper for a long time. We haven't been programming line by line for the past 10 years. First, we gave up designing hardware ourselves. We used computer-aided design, we used computers to design hardware. Now, for the past 10 years, we gave up, willingly so, in order to be more effective and more efficient designing software. We use neural networks that are designing the software instead. So, when this comes together, and software designing hardware designing software is going to be applied to a rapidly increasing set of problems that is in many ways what we can call the singularity.